Hello, can you? Okay. Uh, yes. Great, great. Uh, hi, Human, Brent. Uh, hi, my friend. Uh, I hear you very well. Wonderful. That's great. That's great. Good morning, uh, everyone. For those of you who are on the West Coast, those of you who are on the East Coast, uh, good afternoon. And then uh, uh, welcome to our uh, next talk on the uh, uh, for the uh, e seminar series on biomedical engineering. Today, I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, uh, to host Brent Godow, uh, who is a senior engineer at Foreign Biotech, to give uh, a talk about uh, entrepreneurship opportunities uh, in, in grad schools. Uh, but as usual, and before we start uh, the uh, presentation. Uh, we uh, I would love to go over a few housekeeping notes. Uh, uh, Brent kindly agreed to uh, uh, to record this uh, to post this uh, recorded video on YouTube, so you can you can uh, watch the video later if you want a refresher, uh, or uh, you can pass the link to your uh, friends uh, in case you uh, uh, you think that this uh, talk is interesting for them. Uh, uh, we will send you a link uh, uh, follow up uh, af like following this email but uh, following this uh, this this presentation uh, with a link but you can always google uh, e-seminar series on translational biomedical engineering on YouTube and then um, uh, and then you can find our uh, 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 our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so during the talk, if you have any questions, please make sure that you use the um, uh, ask a question box. There's a box down there uh, in which you can ask your questions. Um, if you if you ask your questions in the uh, uh, in the uh, chat box, then uh, there's a chance that we miss it. So we'll usually add, look at the, the question box box to ask the questions. There is a, also a poll box uh, down there and in the panel below uh, that you can share your thoughts on the uh, on the presenters uh, talk and topic and then the, these e-seminar series. We carefully uh, uh, look at these uh, the feedback that we receive from you and then we'll try to improve the quality of these uh, e-seminar series as we move forward uh, so we have uh, uh, a list of uh, speakers uh, for the for the fall for the next few months uh, uh, so it's there are fantastic speakers uh, very successful uh, researchers and uh, entrepreneurs uh, um, who are going to give uh, uh, their to, to give a talk at the at our uh, uh, e seminar series uh, uh, over the next few weeks. Uh, uh, good news is that uh, we are also planning to continue these e-seminar series in the in the spring uh, of 2021. So uh, stay tuned for the new list of speakers uh, for uh, 2021. Uh, uh, we are also very pleased to uh, uh, to let you know that our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Margaret Magdesian, uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Ananda Devices, uh, and she is going to talk about uh, applying organs and chip platform organs and chip platforms to support uh, sustainability in biomedical research. Uh, there's a lot to learn from her talk, uh, so I highly encourage you to participate in her talk next week and uh, share uh, this uh, information with with your uh, network as well. Uh, if you have any questions uh, from us, feel free to uh, to contact us via email. Uh, our e emails are here. Uh, me and Human are uh, send emails to me and Human. Uh, both of us are, uh, um, are the organizers. And then, uh, if you if, uh, you can also contact uh, Bahid, who is uh, the coordinator of this this e seminar series, in case you have any uh, questions uh, about. Uh, about the logistics of these uh, e-seminar series. You can always follow us on Twitter. Uh, here's our handle, Twitter handle. Feel free to, uh, I mean, uh, share this with your friends and network. We, You will receive the most up-to-date information on our YouTube channel. So uh, also, uh, I would like to acknowledge the support that we have received and we are receiving from our uh, 
uh, sponsors uh, Transmed Tech, uh, which uh, uh, institutes which aims uh, to support the uh, development of innovative medical technologies, train the next generation of professionals, and make uh, innovation in life sciences and engineering. Uh, so uh, they're following a living lab approach uh, that provides an integrated environment that supports uh, interdisciplinary collaborative processes and co-creation of new medical technologies and interventions to catalyze their development and adoption by, by users. Uh, we are also receiving for this talk uh, support from, from Tarasaka Institute for biomedical uh, innovations. Uh, uh, Tarasaka Institute's uh, mission is to invent and foster practical uh, solutions that restores uh, or enhances uh, the health of individuals. Uh, the uh, Tarasaka Institute for Biomedical Innovation envisions a world where personalized medicine is available to all. Uh, they strive to address those uh, uh, the challenges associated with personalized medicine. Uh, uh, using advanced uh, technologies uh, to bridge the gap between uh, sickness and, and wellness. Uh, we thank our speakers. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Brent Godow, who is currently uh, 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 the senior engineer at Forum Biotech, uh, the, the Canadian biotech startup that uh, uh, developing technologies that lie at the interface of cellular biology, biomaterials, and uh, mechanical engineering, as well as artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, Brent uh, has a master's degree, but uh, before that, during his bachelor's degree in chemistry and uh, later on in master's in mechanical engineering, he conducted research in quantum, quantum dot synthesis uh, for medical imaging, biomaterial science, advanced drug delivery, and biofabrication technologies. Uh, he has published many, many papers uh, in prestigious journals, including Lab on a Chip, Advanced Science, and Frontiers in Bioengineering and Biotechnology. Uh, it's quite an achievement for a, a, a grad students, a young grad students. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's not only, I'm, I'm not saying that because he was my grad student and my ex-lab member. Uh, uh, this is, this is, he has, he has a very, uh, 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 interesting personality that's just he he is always pushing things forward and then he's looking at uh, 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 becoming uh, how he can become successful and then he's all for, also very uh, a great team player uh, so uh, uh, Brent in his uh, extracurricular activity Brent has brought together technical teams uh, and founded uh, a biomedical engineering club uh, at University of Victoria. Uh, they won local and national engineering competitions uh, and won uh, awards for his research in cancer modeling and tissue engineering. Brent is, uh, is a believer in uh, STEM uh, outreach and has accomplished uh, this through hosting and presenting in conferences, webinars, and workshops, collaborating with local medtech companies and organizing uh, programs to facilitate professional development of students in in the field of biomedical engineering. I think uh, he was also uh, uh, the organizer or the leader of the uh, Canadian Biomaterial Society uh, student chapter, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in, in, the, in the West Coast. So with that, I would like to uh, uh, thank Brent for accepting to give a talk at our uh, E seminar series and welcome you to uh, to start your talk and uh, the virtual stage is uh, yours now brett okay thank you uh let me just share my screen here okay can you guys see my screen awesome yes Yes, Brent. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay. So uh, let me just first thanks thanks Mosin for the nice introduction and um, thanks Mosin and Human and Bahid for hosting me. Um, this is really a, a great opportunity for me to get to present amongst such an esteemed list of presenters. Um, 
you know, I feel a little bit like a teenage girl at a Justin Bieber concert or something like that, looking at the list of presenters. Um, so it, it's really an exciting opportunity. And uh, I just want to thank everyone, out, uh, everyone for attending as well. Um, today, I'm going to talk about entrepreneurship opportunities in grad school. Um, I've tried to frame this presentation as sort of like a how-to guide. Uh, and I'll mix in some of my personal experiences um, to try and give you examples of, of how you can accomplish some of these things. So, um, as Moshe mentioned, right, right now I'm a, a senior engineer at 4M Biotech. We're a medical device company based in um, Victoria, BC, Canada. And uh, we're trying to commercialize a smart wound dressing device. And so, you know, some of the other presenters have given these nice uh, forays into how they got to where they are. Uh, for me, my journey is a little bit shorter because I'm at an earlier stage in my career, but um, I do remember one specific presentation in this series, Dr. Amanda Malone from Upraxia Pharmaceuticals went into quite a lot of detail about uh, how she got interested in STEM. And I thought it was nice to see, so I'll do something similar, but maybe in not so much detail. But uh, basically, I, I grew up in Shawnigan Lake, BC, which is a, a small town in Western Canada, close to Victoria. And, and if you haven't been to the area, it's close to Vancouver. Um, and, and I sort of gained an interest in STEM. Um, you know, I remember this one particular event in, in grade seven where we got to make a poster on on something and, and I got to make a poster on levers, which is just a really simple mechanical system in my science class. And somehow the stars aligned and in my social studies class, I got the opportunity to put this lever to action and, and build a catapult because we were studying medieval history. And, um, and so, you know, this sequence of first learning about a mechanical system, the lever, and then putting it to action to launch a projectile across the field and behind the school um, was exciting to me. And uh, it, it kind of sparked my interest in STEM. And, you know, fast forward five years later, I'm, I'm graduating from high school and um, uh, decided to pursue uh, a science degree with the, every intention of becoming a pharmacist, actually, by the end of it. I took a couple of years of classes, really enjoyed my chemistry courses, and, and decided to change my degree to be uh, a bachelor's in chemistry, um, nearing which the end of my degree, I, I got the chance to conduct some research in, in a lab um, with under the supervision of Dr. Frank Van Vagel, who is a really established uh, material scientist in the field. And his lab develops um, uh, light emitting nanoparticles for various applications, one of the applications being medical imaging. So I got some experience in conducting research. I graduated um, from that degree and I was so excited to get into the real world and, and find a job. I had my chemistry training and my ha I had my experience in the lab and I applied for so many uh, jobs and I didn't even get a single interview. So uh, I, you know, I thought maybe I need to reevaluate here. Um, so if, if you're in that position where you've, where you've just finished your bachelor's or you're about to finish and you feel like the job prospects are bleak or it's challenging to get a job with just a bachelor's, um, don't worry, you know, grad school is a really good option. And, uh, and, and so uh, you always have that option to come back to school. And um, so instead of, instead of finding a job as a chemist, I worked on a cruise ship nothing STEM related. I worked at the front desk. I was able to save up some money so I could come back to school and, and try and get into a master's. And I had figured out at least, you know, maybe engineering is a better path. It's more applied. There seems to be a, a few more jobs. Um, so I, I entered into the biomedical engineering program at UVic, where I did a minor in business. Um, at the same time, I started volunteering in Mosin's lab and said, hey, Mosin, you know, I, I think I have the skills here. There's enough chemistry overlap in your lab. Um, will you take me on for a master's degree? And he said, yes, let's do it. So fast forward two years later, I, I got the opportunity to join 4M Biotech. And uh, I've been working here for a year now. 
and uh, I'm in a leadership position and, and um, it's a really exciting job. So um, I'm gonna talk today about a couple of different pathways um, that you can take throughout grad school to generate some entrepreneurship opportunities for yourself. And these two different pathways are the curricular pathway where you kind of conduct your regular program curriculum with entrepreneurship in mind. Uh, and then the extracurricular pathway where, you know, there are op opportunities outside of your program curriculum um, that really can, can help to set you up for entrepreneurial opportunities or um, career opportunities, or, you know, maybe you can get involved with a startup or something like that. So first we'll take a look at this curricular pathway where we try to build an entrepreneurship opportunity through your graduate research. So if we just first kind of take a step back and think about, okay, this is a series about translational biomedical engineering. Um, so let's think, what is translational research? Um, you can see this definition on the right hand side. I pulled this from Wikipedia. Um, so I'm sure there are lots of different definitions out there, but this one works well for the, for the purpose of this presentation. It's an interdisciplinary branch of the biomedical field supported by three main pillars, bench side, bedside, and community. So if we take this definition and we, and we take a look at, you know, a common um, process of medical device development, and this process works for other things like pharmaceuticals, and, you know, it has some parallels with developing technologies that are used in biotech applications. We can see that, you know, we have this phase where we ideate something, we prove the concept, we start to test it on the bench side. We eventually get to the point where we can test it um, at the bedside or in a clinical setting, and eventually it gets commercialized and is out into the community. And um, fortunately for, for graduate research, there are some parallels in your graduate research that allow you to sort of accomplish a few of these steps while you're in grad school. So if we look at kind of the typical process for um, a graduate degree, it's that, you know, first you're kind of searching for your grad school program and then you, you apply to it. At the start of your program, you define your project and you do an extensive literature review. You try to become an expert um, in your field. Uh, you start conducting research, doing your experiments. Eventually you've done enough that you start to write your thesis and you defend it either in a candidacy exam or a thesis defense. And maybe you have a couple cycles through this, these three steps here, and then eventually you graduate. So if we take a look at this and we compare it to that medical device development um, process, we can see that sort of these first few steps here um, are similar enough here that we can actually accomplish not only the discovery and ideation of a medical device or, or of, a, of an invention of a technology that can be used within biomedical engineering applications, um, but we can accomplish this invention and prototyping and maybe even some of this preclinical testing. So what I'm gonna do is just go through each of these phases and, and show how you can supplement these parts of your education um, to try and set yourself up for an entrepreneurship opportunity. And, and maybe, you know, if your project has commercial potential, you can start a company by the end of your uh, degree. So at this point where you're trying to think, okay, where do I wanna go to grad school? Um, and uh, you, you need to identify a couple of things first, right? What's your area of interest and what department does this fall in? Um, you know, what program type are you interested in? If you have an idea and, and your idea is, is, you know, somewhat complex or, or is going to need a lot of development, maybe try and consider doing a PhD because that's about three to four years of guaranteed funding that you have, you know, with all of these tools at your disposal from the university to try and develop your technology technology and get it as far along as possible before you try and start a company. Um, one thing that's a little bit different here that I really recommend doing um, to, to help you identify a, a supervisor and a university that you like is 
first figure out companies that you like, you know, look at their products, figure out what they do. How do their products make money? Um, try and understand, you know, maybe how they develop their products and, and got to the point of, of selling them and, and look at their team and, and see, you know, is there a dream job at these companies? Do I want to be a chief technical officer? Do I want to be a director of research and development, or do I want to be a, an R and D scientist? Um, what, what are your dream jobs at these companies and try and consider this, uh, or, or be aware of this when you're looking for, um, a PI for your grad school. Um, so, so you get to the point of searching, okay, you know, you've got some universities in mind and, and you know what department or your area of interest falls in. So you can find a faculty member with your area of interest. Once you've done that, take a look at things like who funds their research, right? This is often on, on a faculty member's website. For example, if, if I were to look at Mosin's website, I would see funding partners on there and I would realize that, you know, he's funded by some government, some not-for-profit. He also has um, some funding from industry, for example, an advanced um, drug delivery company. He's got a cell therapy company, um, an instrument company that all fund his research. And these are companies that make cool products that, you know, I'm interested in that technology. Um, so I can immediately take that information and understand, all right, there, there's some um, parallels with technology that I'm interested in that, you know, are being developed in, in this lab. And then one thing that I think, you know, if you're really entrepreneurial and you want to generate an entrepreneurship opportunity for yourself is to ask, does the faculty member have a history of starting companies? And this might not be immediately available on their website or something like that. Hopefully it is. If for people, if there's faculty watching this, please make this information available on your website. Um, but this information is really helpful, right? Because if you can go to someone and, and you know, maybe this information isn't on their website, you can go to them and say, have you started companies before? I have an idea to start a company or I want to start a company, but I don't have an idea. You know, it, you start off on the right foot with, someone that you're interested in joining their lab and and if they're aware that you want to generate an entrepreneurship opportunity from grad school then you can get off you know hit the ground running get off to a fast start and um you know maybe maybe improve your chances at starting a company by the time you finish your uh graduate program so after you've applied and, and entered into a program you need to ask yourself, does your project have commercial potential? So the way that you can figure this out is um, by conducting a market analysis. And you know the easiest way to, to kind of do this is just to Google how to conduct a market analysis. It's pretty straightforward. You, know, you look at things like the size of the market you hope to impact, um, what other companies operate within this market? Are you competing against them? Do they have similar products? How would your product be sold? How would it make money, right? If you're developing a technology um, to be commercialized, you know, most likely it needs to be patented. So you need to make considerations of patentability in your technology. And, um, you know, if, if you have every intention of becoming an entrepreneur for a technology company or working, you know, at the ground level of a, of a startup that's trying to commercialize a technology, you probably need to learn about patents. So just take the time, you know, understand how patents are written, how um, patents are litigated, you know, how, how do they protect technology and, um, and make sure you can, you know, read patents and, and understand what they mean. And if you take to do, take the time to do that and, and, you know, kind of give a little bit of an assessment of your project and, and make sure it's patentable, um, that's an important part of being able to commercialize it. And uh, lastly, you need to make sure that your, your technology is manufacturable. So, you know, if it costs, $10,000 to make one of one piece of your technology and you can only sell it for $7,000, then it's most likely not going to make um, sense for a business. 
So if you can, you know, look into the materials that are required, look into common manufacturing technologies that might be used to, to make your technology, um, then you can ensure that it's manufacturable. And, you know, throughout the process, you can actually design it to be more manufacturable. This is a really common thing that's done in industry is called design for manufacture. So let's say you're already in grad school, you've got your project, you're already partway through it, and it has no commercial potential. That's no problem. It doesn't matter that much. There are still plenty of ways you can generate entrepreneurship opportunities in grad school, right? You can ask questions like, does your project provide you with a, with a career opportunity? Like, who funds the project? For example, um, for me, my, my project in my master's had no commercial potential because it was funded by a, an industry uh, member that was wanting to develop their technology further so that they could increase their market share. So immediately, because it's funded by an industry member, um, it, you know, that technology that I'm developing is essentially owned by them. Um, so, you know, there's no potential for, for me taking this on and starting a company with it. Um, but because it was funded by them, I was able to say, all right, here's someone who works in a, you know, medium stage startup company. Um, I, I recognize that, you know, they have some involvement in my project. So I said, okay, can I come and visit your guys' headquarters and just work with you guys for a little bit? So I got the chance to go and visit their headquarters, you know, work for a week, get to know the CTO of the company and the CEO of the company. Got some really good FaceTime, got to present a workshop with them at a conference. And, um, and now they've, you know, I knew there was maybe a job opportunity with them when I was finishing my degree. I wasn't interested in, in moving away from the West Coast of Canada. But they still come to me, you know, with with different offers on the table. I got to present a webinar for them. Um, they've put me in contact with people who are looking for engineers for certain projects and things like that. So just making that um, addition to my network was really useful. Other things you consider is can you use this project to network with the right people, right? Can you... Um, take, you know, talk, talk as an expert in the content of your project and, and talk to people who might be an entrepreneur in a, in a similar space or something like that. Um, and where can you present the project? Can you present it at a conference where they have a pitch competition um, for, for startups? You know, you don't necessarily have to pitch your project, but just go to the pitch competition and, and be a part of it and meet people that are in this same entrepreneurial mindset and, and just try and get involved within the community. So uh, you've got your project defined, you're, you're conducting your research. What can you do within your research to try and set you up, you know, so that, you know, you're ready to start a company and, and you can run your company, how people are, are running their companies in industry. So when you're doing your research, you should try as best as you can to use industry best practice to guide your research. And it's really hard to know exactly what industry best practice is when you haven't worked in industry. But basically, um, you have to do a bit of reading and you have to try and understand and, and teach yourself as you go along. But when you're choosing and conducting your experiments, ask yourself things like, does this experiment contribute to the commercialization of the project or the product, right? Are you maybe building on the proof of concept are you showing that this um, has good performance or it's effective, um, that it's safe to use, or maybe you're just generating some content that you know is, is good for marketing the technology? You can ask yourself questions like, is there an industry standard for the experiment or test that I'm using? If we take a look at this list down below here, there are all these different types of design considerations for medical devices um, a lot of these apply for other types of technologies as well. But if we look at, say, bi doing biocompatibility testing, there's, there's a standard for this. You know, if you follow ISO 10993 for biocompatibility testing and you use that standard to, you know, test your device and you can publish this data as well. 
um, it, it's really good experience for you and it contributes to the commercialization of, of your technology, right? And lastly, um, companies, they, they have to maintain a really high uh, standard of quality if they're a, a technology manufacturer. And the way that they do this is that they document everything, right? A quality management system um, is basically a way of documenting that your technology is being manufactured reliably, safely, and, um, and you have the records to prove it. So you basically, for, for all of your experiments, you should make a document that describes the rationale for your experiment, write up a detailed protocol, and then write up a document that describes the results and how you interpret them. And this is what companies are doing. So having this contributes to the development of your technology and it gets you into the practice of, of doing this once you actually start a company. So let's say you've kind of finished your research, you're getting close to being able to write your thesis. Um, there are a few things you can do here, right? If you've, if you've done that last step I mentioned of documenting all of your experiments, then all that information is there. You can insert it into your thesis. That's helped you out. You just have to maybe change the wording a bit to work for your thesis and, and you're good to go, right? In your introduction, you should try to summarize your market assessment um, as succinctly as possible and uh, as effectively as possible because w the next step, you know, if you're going to try and start a company after conducting your research is that um, you need to apply for funding and and most of the funding that um, comes about for industry research and development um, or startup companies you have to have a market assessment so have a nice succinct explanation of your market assessment you can use that for funding applications you might have to expand upon it a bit but it but it's really useful um, you can generate figures with schematics that summarize how your technology works in really simple terms, right? When you're trying to pitch a business idea and you're talking about your technology, most of your business pitch is actually about the marketing side and then you'll have maybe a couple of slides that describe your technology. So if you can have a really simple figure that you know describes your technology in simple terms and shows how impactful it is, that can be really useful for a business pitch. Um, when you're defending your thesis, right, you part, part of the process is that you have to come up with your committee that uh, examines your thesis, right? If, you know, of course, of course, your committee has to be scientifically expert in the field of research that you're, you're working in. Um, but if you can select your committee such that they also maybe are entrepreneurial, um, look at their websites, see if they've started a company or see if they are part of other organizations and things like that. They can give you really good feedback on the commercial potential of your device and, and you can, you know, quite directly just ask them for feedback on that. Um, and then really take note of their criticism and improve upon it. This is something that, you know, as you're going through developing a device, I, I experienced this in 4M Biotech, we take every bit of criticism that we get and we, and we take it in cons into consideration and try and improve our, our technology. So, you know, this, this phase of your graduate degree, this is maybe the last year of your degree or something like that. If you're truly considering starting a, a business in your grad degree, then you don't want to have a lag time after you graduate to the point where you get funding into your company. You want to be able to start, you know, right away. And, and so the things you need to be thinking about nearing the end of your degree is, should I, should I establish my business, right? Do I need to incorporate? Um, you should probably start pursuing grant applications um, from non-dilutive funding sources. Right, there are a lot of government programs for startups and new grads and things like that. And then you should really start pitching your business idea, whether it's in a competition or whether it's to key opinion leaders or people who can give you good feedback on your business. Just start pitching it and practicing. So, this 
is the curricular pathway, right? I've described some ways that we can supplement this pathway to try and set yourself up um, for entrepreneurship when you're at the end of your degree. But I think there's, uh, you know, this pathway, the extracurricular pathway is equally, if not more important than the curricular pathway in setting yourself up for, for being a successful entrepreneur. Um, or just to set yourself up for a career opportunity or getting involved in uh, a startup, right? So there are a few things that you can do here. And, um, and basically, the gist of it is that you seek entrepreneurship opportunities in the university environment. There are really common things, you know, from university to university, um, really common opportunities that you can, you can seek. And the, the idea is that, you know, you find where the ideas for startups are being generated. And then you just go there and you get involved and you meet people and you network and you be aggressive and, and try and um, uh, just set yourself up to either get involved with a startup, meet someone who's willing to start a business with you, um, you know, try and set yourself up for these types of opportunities. So I mean, it's just going to go through through these different steps of the extracurricular pathway, uh, and then I'll summarize it for you guys at the end. But basically, um, one of the first things that you can do in grad school that is going to be really useful in setting yourself up for you know entrepreneurial activities is just getting involved in the campus incubator or startup program. So uh, a startup incubator is basically a collaborative program for companies that has all of these resources to help you start a business. And most universities have, you know, something like a startup incubator, some, some equivalent type of programming. If you're, if you're really serious about entrepreneurship and, um, and trying to, start a business by the end of your degree or get involved with a startup and you're looking at a university that doesn't have an incubator program, I, I would suggest looking at other universities because this is so integral in, in facilitating startups, right? We have one on campus at the University of Victoria, which is where I did my grad degree and, and where um, 4M Biotech spun out of. And and my office was at this incubator, you know, they have, they've given us advice for patenting. They've connected us with people that um, have brought in, you know, that have resulted in us getting funding into the company. Um, they give you mentorship. They have an executive in residence that, you know, can give us advice. And you're just around um, people that are in a similar scenario, right? So if, if there's a company that's slightly ahead of you and they're involved in the incubator programming, um, you can seek advice from them or vice versa, right? If there's a company that's a little bit behind you in, in their um, stage, you can go and give them advice. And uh, it's just a really beneficial environment for, for people who are entrepreneurial, right? And if you have, say, let's say you start your grad degree um, uh, sorry, Brent. Uh, we we, we yeah. lost your video. Uh, can you turn it on again? My video. Okay, let me just see. Yes, here. thank you. Sorry. I mean, uh... Oh, there is that better? Go. We're good. We're good. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You guys are hearing me okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everything is good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. So if you're, um, if you're, starting grad school and you don't have an idea for a business, um, but you want to become an entrepreneur or get involved with a startup, I recommend just starting to go to events at a startup incubator. They often have pitch competitions, business plan competitions, and showcases for the businesses that use their programming. If you go to these events, look for companies that you would be interested in getting involved with and just start talking to those people and saying, hey, you know, I really like your technology. I like your product idea. Can I help you? Can I work part time for you? Do you take on co-ops? Maybe try and do a co-op with their startup company. Pro probably it won't pay very well, but um, it's, it's a foot in the door to try and get involved with a startup. So um, 
another another good path into generating some entrepreneurial activities is to get involved in a club right and so why why would you do that you you have the chance to obtain experience that you don't get in graduate studies and you get the chance to make some friends that are really motivated right so most most people who join clubs are uh, motivated people they're doing stuff outside of their coursework or their program curriculum uh, to try and better themselves so i'll give you a little bit of a story um, when i was in university uh, i got the chance to start a club you know through one of my friends in university he said we're thinking about starting this club but i'm i'm going on a co-op and so i can't do it anymore are you interested in taking this over? And I said, yes, for sure. So I started a club with, with a few people. Um, we got the chance to develop a, uh, an incontinence monitoring system that was invented by a local gentleman um, to help his daughter with cerebral palsy. And so um, we got this experience where we developed a, um, a medical device basically uh, for a client, right? He got to keep the intellectual property. We got the exper experience in developing the device and we got the chance to enter the, the device in a national competition where we ended up winning. And we generated some good publicity for this gentleman and his device. We got really good experience. Um, you know, I got to put an accomplishment on my resume it wasn't necessarily something that directly translated to an entrepreneurship opportunity, but these accomplishments add credibility to, to me as, as a person when I'm talking to other people who are interested in funding startups and things like that. And not only that, clubs are places where, you know, often ideas are being generated and people who are um, go-getters are, are working in these types of clubs. So, so just getting involved, you know, not only can you get experience, you can fill a gap in your skill set, you can um, meet potential clients or customers or companies that sponsor the club. It's just a really good opportunity to network and, and meet like minded people who who are um, who are ambitious, basically. Um, Another thing that you need to be doing, I think this is really important um, throughout your graduate school, is that you need to compete in as many things as possible, right? You need to apply for awards, you need to participate in engineering competitions, you need to present at conferences and publish your work, because the more accomplishments you put on your resume, this translates to, be, to, to credibility. And when someone is looking at trying to fund a startup, um, not only do they look at your technology and, and what, your, what your business model is and things like that, they really look at who, who is running the company and, um, and they need to see some level of accomplishment, you know, to show that, to show credibility and, and show that um, you're not just going to waste their money, right? They invest just as much in the people who are running a startup um, as they do in uh, the actual technology or the product itself, right? So as an entrepreneur, they tend to embrace competition um, and, and they tend to try and, you know, generate accomplishments and promote those accomplishments as well. So competing at, at, at anything you can um, is, is really useful for yourself uh, to generate opportunities, right? And so lastly, um, you need to network. And I know that people have probably heard this a million times over, but networking is such an important part of generating opportunities for yourself. And it's really about building useful relationships, right? So I'll give you an example. I participated in this engineering competition in 2018 or 2019. I can't remember which year it was, but um, I put together a team. You know, I, I found people that were really capable 
and hardworking, right? So when you enter something like these competitions, if you're serious about trying to win or, or trying to generate an accomplishment for yourself, um, don't just pick your friends because you're, they're your friends. Pick people who you think are going to help you win the competition, right? Build a, um, a well-rounded team, right? That's what you have to do when you own a company. You don't just pick people because they're your friends. You pick people because you know they're capable and that they're going to benefit your cause. So we entered this competition. We ended up placing second. Um, and, and there was a judge um, in, in the uh, judging committee that worked for a local medical device company called Starfish Medical. Um, and, and I was really interested in maybe working for this company when I was done my master's degree. So I went and, and talked to him and I said, hey, I really like your company that you work for. Um, I'm interested in working there. I did well in this competition. What do you think about just setting up a phone call? He said, okay, well, let's do one better. How about you come down to the company headquarters and I'll take you for a tour of the facility. So I went and I did the tour. Um, I recognized that this is a really useful relationship for myself. You know, it ended up resulting in, I, I continued this relationship and just tried to extend it, right? Keeping in contact with the person. It ended up generating the opportunity for me to write a couple of blogs for their website. I got to present at a conference with the gentleman from this company. And, um, and eventually I got an interview with this company, right? And, you know, throughout this relationship, I learned that this gentleman owns another company that's a contract research organization. And I'm now in a role at a medical device company where we need to use a contract research organization to um, help with part of the development of our technology. And so not only did I get um, some, some valuable experience from this relationship, Later on down the line, I, I maintain that relationship. And, and now there's some business to business interaction between our company and their company, right? So when you're networking, try to find people that work for companies that you're interested in or companies that have potential for business to business interactions with your startup that you want to start. Um, look for people that own or work in startups, right? Ask them for opportunities. How can you get involved? look for key opinion leaders. Like if you're developing, let's give an example here. If, if you're developing a cardiac tissue for um, pharmaceutical development uh, testing, um, look and, and say you meet a um, cardiac surgeon or a cardiologist or something like that, ask them uh, what they think about your technology. Get their phone number, just start talking to them and say, hey, look, I'm working on this. What do you think about it? Get some feedback. It allows you to, to improve your technology and um, you never know what, what other opportunities might come out of, a, out of a relationship like that. Also look for representatives of funding organizations. Your company is not going to be successful if there's no money to run it. So. You know, there are government organizations that help fund startups. Um, there are investor organizations, um, things like that, not-for-profits and whatnot. So look for representatives of these organizations and get in touch with them. You should always be ready to network. So uh, in summary, we have these two sort of pathways to generate entrepreneurial opportunities for yourself. One is through the curriculum of your program. And, you know, obviously this is what you sign up for when you start graduate school. So you should really be set spending most of your time here. Um, but this extracurricular pathway is really effective at, at generating other opportunities for yourself and, and trying to set yourself up with the opportunity to join a startup um, or to start your own business or to, you know, meet people that you can start a business with and things like that. So I recommend spending, you know, up to a third of your time on this extracurricular pathway. Your supervisor might not like that, but, um, but it's really helpful. And, you know, for me, um, how I ended up in 4M Biotech, I would say it's a combination of working hard within my program curriculum 
obviously I didn't have a, um, uh, a project with commercial potential, but I was working in an environment where the principal investigator was entrepreneurial himself. I showed that I was capable in this environment. I generated some accomplishments through this extracurricular pathway. The timing worked out well and I got to join 4M Biotech where now I'm in a leadership position and I'm an integral part of growing this company. Uh, so it's really exciting. So I'd like to thank you guys for listening and thanks Mosin and Human and Vahid for, for hosting me here. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Brent. Uh, really exciting uh, journey you had <clears throat> and I'm sure that you know, our, our audience also benefit from your experience and uh, the advice. So the, uh, let's go to the question. The first question is an interesting question. Uh, so for, for you, you mentioned during your, uh, you know, talk that, okay, you go to graduate school and you get uh, some credibility for different things and you put it on your resume and then you tr attract funding. So one of our uh, audience, Karen, Asking, would you recommend getting a PhD to have more credibility? Um, it definitely helps. Um, I, you know, I can't speak from the experience, unfortunately, because I didn't uh, do my PhD. But I, I would imagine that it does add credibility. Um, but I think that, you know, a lot of people go through getting their PhD and they focus solely on their research and, and not so much generating some other accomplishments along the way. And, um, and, and there's quite a number of people who do that. So I think that if you, if you work through your degree and getting a PhD, it's extremely challenging. It's an incredible accomplishment. But if you want to become an entrepreneur, you need to show that you kind of are working as hard as possible you know, in all aspects of your yourself and your potential career. So, you know, having those other accomplishments that tag along with your research, I think really bolster your, um, your credibility. And so, you know, people recognize that a master's is, is shorter than a PhD and it takes less time. So if you have that master's and you have done other things in your master's to add to your credibility, that people people can do the calculation and say you know this person in two years has accomplished this much and they've accomplished this much in four years so i think regardless of whether you go for that master's or phd route people are able to do the calculation and say they've accomplished this much in this amount of time yeah so yeah so because you already you are i'm actually on the way of uh, you know uh, uh, growing this company and the stuff so most of the time you realize and you want to, I mean, I mean uh, improve your skills or experience and you realize that you're lacking some knowledge, skills and other stuff. So can you like uh, reflect, uh, you know, how do you see that? Do you see any, you know, room for improvements in into different skills, management, entrepreneurial during, you know, when you are on the way of, you know, uh, so could you comment on that? For sure, yeah. So I think um, universities offer so much programming to um, train yourself uh, in, in areas outside of your graduate research, right? So if, if you're going through your program and, you know, say you're, you're wanting to start a company with someone who's doing their MBA mm -hmm. um, and you're, you're a person who's developing a technology or something like that, then you, you guys probably know that, you know, the MBA person is going to be doing the market analysis and, and pitching the idea and, and doing that aspect of it. So maybe you should be focused more on the technology development side, learning how, you know, quality, quality management systems are implemented in technology development, learning how patents work, right? I can give you an example at 4M Biotech. Um, we've been working on our patent strategy and, and how we can expand our capabilities in, in protecting our technology and, and be really efficient with our patenting because not only is it expensive, um, it's so essential to the success of the company 
that we need to really pick and choose, um, you know, where we can, we can make ourselves successful with patenting. And so I didn't have any experience when I joined the company in patenting, but I took, you know, a lot of time out of my job to, to learn how patents are written, how people write claims. I researched, you know, other competitors within this field, how they've tried to patent all of the technologies that are coming through their pipeline. And, you know, understanding how uh, technology from its infancy or from its ideation is patented as, as a platform. And then maybe they continue patenting technologies later down the line um, that are parts of that platform or add to that platform, right? It, I, I spent the time to learn how patents work, how people are writing patents, um, because it was a necessity for, for the company. And so trying to identify what the company needs, uh, you know, at the time, um, and if it's not even a company yet, what does it need to, to become a company? Um, identifying what the needs are, and, and taking the time to teach yourself or to seek help. Um, you know, there are a lot of resources out there. So if you, if you can't find the help somewhere, sometimes you have to just help yourself as well. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, now we've got many questions in the question box. Please uh, also ask many, many questions from Brent. So, uh, yeah, kind of personal question. Are, at this stage of your career, are you considering a PhD? If so, why? My um, emotion is laughing probably. <laughs> yeah. uh, so for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested to, uh, <laughs> to hearing Brent's idea. Most and then I'm the putting in my this, two this weeks. This is a tricky question. Uh, putting in my two weeks. <laughs> uh, so I, right now I'm not considering a PhD. Um, oh. for, for me, I, I went to school always with the intention of finding a job and uh, working in industry. And so, um, you know, the P PhD route can be a really good route to finding a job in industry. Um, but you definitely build an expertise that can be a bit more narrow, right? And you have to kind of go where the jobs are. Um, for me, I've, I've always had the intention of, of living on the west coast of Canada. My family's here. I really value my, um, you know, life outside of work. And so I didn't feel that the PhD route benefited me in trying to set myself up for a career in this area. So that's kind of the reason that um, I haven't pursued that. And, uh, and I felt that, you know, my work outside of most of them don't listen. My work outside of my actual graduate research was really what benefited me. My relationship with Mosin really benefited me, but my actual re work outside my research uh, was really helpful in, in accomplishing my goals. So, yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank you. So, just uh, a follow up. You know, since now you are, uh, I mean, uh, you have a full time position in the company, and uh, Laura is uh, interested to know. Are you still, uh, you know, uh, joining any extracurricular activity related to the entrepreneurship and networking? Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, not so much for the entrepreneurship side of things. Um, I've gotten the opportunity to do some consulting on on the side for a, another startup, um, and so that's been really exciting um, to to help them work on, you know, their pitch and things like that. Um, I also get uh, the opportunity to do things like this, present in webinars and, and series, webinars and seminar series and things like that. So I take these types of opportunities. Um, yeah, so I, I think I, I do look for opportunities outside of work to, you know, develop myself at a professional capacity. Um, but I'm quite excited about the position that I'm in and um, once once you get involved in a startup, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck. You have to um, work really hard and and um, try to benefit the company in as many ways as possible. So you end up focusing a lot of your effort within the company. Great, thank you so much, Brent. So uh, exceptionally today, I have to leave uh, now. Uh, 
So Mohsen will continue with you with other questions and uh, good luck, uh, Brent. Hope we catch up soon. Yes, sounds good. Thanks, Uman. Nice Thank to see you. you. Nice to see you. Bye bye. Thank you, Matt, and then uh, thanks, Brent, for your very interesting talk. Uh, and then, uh, sorry that I'm uh, one of the organizers. I know that there's a lot of pressure on you uh, <laughs> when uh, you're trying to answer some of the questions. But uh, but I'm just uh, you know me, so uh, I'll just just yeah. uh, have your opinion, whatever that you think is beneficial for everyone. It is good. So Brent is is very very. Uh, what I like about Brent is that he is very professional. Uh, and then uh, that level of professionality actually convinced me to uh, to talk to our uh, CEO, and then uh, and then uh, also encouraged us to uh, to to uh, uh, make an offer uh, for to to brand to join our company. And he is a great asset for us uh, these days. And then we are trying to we will do our best to keep him and uh, the in the company. He plays a central role in, in many aspects of. Uh, 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 different aspects of the company. Uh, so uh, the the other question um, uh, that was uh, raised uh, was from from Chris uh, uh, Chris Flores from uh, the University of Victoria uh, uh, RPKM Research Partnership uh, uh, and Knowledge Tra Knowledge Transfer Unit. Uh, so uh, the question that Chris has is about. Uh, the differences between uh, publications and patenting. So, can you comment on making publication uh, and um, versus patenting the results of the research and some of the benefits of each of these, and then some of the challenges that you may face when you want to publish your results in journals or patent the results, which comes first, which comes last, and then and then maybe share your thoughts on on, on these uh, mm -hmm. basically uh, differences. Sure. So I think um, patenting is, is so essential to the commercialization of uh, technology, right? If if you want to say um, commercialize your technology and ensure that other people are not going to copy your technology, um, you need to have patents in place. That being said, when you can publish, it adds an incredible amount of credibility to your technology. So to me, the question comes down to really the timing of when you do these things. So if, if you have a technology with commercial potential, um, do a really detailed market analysis, you know, try to clearly define the commercial potential of this technology and if, if it's worth pursuing before you publish. Because if you can, you know, demonstrate that this is something that's worth pursuing um, before you publish, uh, then you can submit a um, uh, a patent application, um, you know, that gives you a year of time to continue developing the technology before you actually have to submit a, a, a patent application. So um, uh, a patent pre-submission, I, I forget what the exact name is. You, you know what it is, Chris. Um, but... Uh, Basically, if, if you can figure out the timing, you know, you can submit that um, pre-application for your patent, uh, publish your results, gain the credibility, and then within a year you have to submit your patent application. Um, then that gives you the time to further, further develop your technology. You get that credibility from your publication. And um, if, if you want to publish before you submit that, um, pre-patent application, then you um, have entered your technology into the literature or the, entered it into the universe and basically it becomes um, common knowledge. So you can't patent it after that stage. Okay, all right. Uh, so uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so uh, I have one question myself before we go into uh, uh, other questions. There are there are many other questions uh, uh, in the in the question box, uh, but my question is uh, about your experience with quality management systems and, and uh, documenting the results. And then I noticed that you recommended that uh, uh, during the uh, curricular pathway 
uh, the one that you are doing your research and then you recommend that, that while you're doing your research is good. It's a good practice to uh, to follow the quality management system and record all the results and then uh, and then uh, then later on it's, it's it might be it, it will be much easier for you to just take the data from from all these recorded uh, documents and then put them in your thesis or in a paper or in a pattern that uh, you want to publish later on but uh, this is not a common practice in labs, in, in research labs. So uh, in research labs, we do not know how to do it. And it's a, there's a lot of paperwork uh, involved in the quality management system. Uh, so uh, what are your thoughts and comments uh, on, on this, on the use of quality management system in a research lab? And uh, what do you recommend to, to grad students uh, to like, uh, about using this or implementing this 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 kind of system and documentation uh, in their uh, in their research definitely uh, you know we both know from experience that it's extremely challenging to implement these systems in a research setting so oftentimes a research setting is something that um, especially in in academia um, where you know you're partway through an experiment and you realized you forgot to um, prepare this solution so you make up a, a, a new protocol halfway through your experiment and, and adjust it to, to try and generate some data still. Um, this is something that's not, uh, that doesn't work as well within a quality management system. I think the idea in, in applying industry best practice within academic research is um, you know, maybe maybe a, a model that might work a little bit more efficiently for academic labs where you have a lot of company or you have a lot of turnover within the lab. You know, you don't want to have to put the effort into training people every four months um, is that you have a bit of a hybrid system. So you get that documentation, you get the experience, you get the practice, um, but you're not so strict that um, you know, a document is null and void if someone took a, a, a slightly different approach halfway through the experiment. So just getting the practice and, and um, getting, you know, a, a decent level of documentation, obviously people will get better as they go. So if you're at the start of deg your degree, you know, you might be okay at it. By the end of it, you should be pretty good at sticking to your protocols and things like that. Um, but getting that hybrid system, you know, where people are just putting it into practice, I think it benefits the individual, but it benefits the lab, right? Especially in an academic setting, if you have turnover and, uh, and you're conducting the same experiments, you know, over and over again for your research, um, having these protocols that are being refined and refined over the years, and they can be passed over to new students and, and new members of your lab. Um, you know, it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a, uh, uh, or it's a big help, you know, in training people basically. So having something that's not so strict, but, um, you know, still accomplishes the practice is I think good enough. And it's beneficial for, for both the PI in the lab and then also the students. Again, it's, it's, the beginning it's very difficult to follow all these paper rules and then you know forms and everything but mm -hmm. eventually when you get to use uh, how to when you learn how to use them then uh, it becomes much easier uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then uh, the other thing uh, benefit is that as you mentioned then when it comes to writing your thesis it's just a matter of copy pasting the document mm -hmm. from uh, uh, like the, the text from from these forms and documents in, into your thesis so yeah. that's uh, that also helps uh, well thank you I'm, I'm a, for, for your uh for your answer. i really like the idea of hybrid uh, and then we're trying to implement this this hybrid method in the lab mm -hmm. uh, there is always some resistance uh even even from my side but we'll we'll do our best uh, yeah, so sure. uh another question is from uh, jesse and then she's asking about uh, uh, IP rights. So how should students manage IP rights? Uh, how much goes to the PI or an industrial partner or the university? And uh, when should the university tech transfer liaison office get involved? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, I'll be I'll be completely honest. I don't have a lot of experience um, to give a, a great answer for this question. Um, what I can say is that I think when that university tech transfer and industry liaison gets involved is is when you're trying to use the IP for a commercial purpose. So maybe most and you might have a bit more insight on, into. Um, you know who who owns the rights to the IP, but I think the person who is using it for the commercial purpose ends up um, taking the rights a lot of the time. Yes, yes, it's a it's a big uh, it needs a, another talk. It's it's a very interesting topic, but uh, but I mean in brief, uh, uh, well, I mean uh, the IP if if you develop a technology in universities, and it depends from university to university, but it's usually. The IP is owned by a university, but university makes a deal with with the, with the inventors, and then it's just a matter of negotiations uh, between the inventors uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the percentage of the IP, and then how much goes to to who during the uh, uh, during the uh, like the filing the IP and then uh, through university, and then also university different universities have. At different rules. Some universities they take 50% of the IP and then they share 50%. Some universities more, some universities less. But uh, in terms of when should the university tech transfer uh, um, office, uh, uh, when should we uh, involve them? And my suggestion is uh, is to uh, uh, to get them involved right before you uh, want to publish your results. Uh, so uh, because you have enough data that you can you can support your your patent because they have to do their own due diligence right and then um, having a, a paper a draft of your a first draft of your paper is very helpful because then they can look at the prior art uh, by reading your introduction and then uh, uh, as a starting point they can do their own due diligence and then they can tell you whether their university is interested in investing in this technology uh, or not um, the good thing about our university is that uh, there's some level of flexibility and then they let us own our own IP. If, if Jovic uh, does its uh, own due diligence, if they think that they're not interested, then they let you go ahead and then file your patents and IPs and then follow the commercialization yourself. But uh, uh, we've been lucky to have a, a lot of support from from. Our university tech transfer and industry uh, liaison office. Uh, I mean, they they um, they have more knowledge than uh, than us usually, and then uh, they know they've done this many many times. So they usually give you great advice on, on how to uh, how to buy the IT. So uh, and then protect it. But that's again, it's it's a matter of several negotiations uh, between among the inventors and then also university and and and, and the inventors themselves. Uh, so the other question is uh, from Hoda, and then uh, the question she has is uh, uh, that how can I find startups within med tech area in Canada? Yeah, it. Uh, you know, it can be challenging to find startup companies. Um, I think uh, the the most effective way is to get involved in local events and, and network. Um, it depends where you are in Canada, what types of events they have. But I think around most universities, they have a lot of events that um, promote uh, new companies and things like that within certain industries. So for example, we have one in BC called the British Columbia Life Sciences um, Organization. And they host these events where companies can, they have one that's called the BC Investor Summit. And so all of these life sciences companies and medical companies go to these types of uh, summits, you know, they're at the stage where they're looking for investment. So that's a pretty good stage for a startup where, you know, they've got some money that's come into the company. They're ready to start looking for non-dilutive uh, funding. And, you know, those those types of companies are probably actively growing and, and looking to hire people. Um, so those types of events are really good to find 
um, companies, if you go to uh, websites for different startup incubators, um, that's also a really good resource to try and find startup companies. For example, the University of Toronto has um, the Mars Discovery District or something like that. That's an organization that helps these companies try and commercialize their technologies. There's another organization in Toronto called the CCRM, which is the Center for the Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine. They have a lot of um, company partners that uh, I think are just listed on their website. So, you know, getting involved in the community, looking for events, looking for organizations that support startups and looking on their websites, contacting these organizations. Um, I think th these types of activities help to sort of um, show you what companies are, are around. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, we're running out of time. So let's just ask one last question from the from the audience. And I have a list of questions, but maybe I can ask you later. I have the luxury to have access uh, uh, Brent and then ask him my questions. I, was lear I learned a lot from you, Brent. Thank you for your uh, very nice talk. So the question is from uh, Karen and then she says, uh, where can we follow your work network with you? Uh, so I am, I mean, most of my, my professional work right now is um, behind the guise of our company. So it, it's, uh, unfortunately, I can't share it too much publicly, but um, I am on LinkedIn. If you're interested in connecting with me on LinkedIn, please do so. Um, I do post on LinkedIn semi-regularly. Um, you know, I should post more. But uh, whenever I'm doing these types of events, like webinars and things like that, I do post them on LinkedIn. So, so I think that's probably the best medium. Great, awesome. Well, uh, I would like to thank uh, Brent again for his uh, fascinating talk and uh, uh, like, uh, insightful comments and advices. Uh, uh, before we end this session, I would like to thank our, uh, again, our, our sponsors, Transmed Tech and Terasaki Institutes. Uh, uh, we cannot run these e-seminar series without the support of uh, uh, our sponsors. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I just wanted to remind you all that uh, our next spe speaker is, uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Margaret uh, Magdesian, the CEO and founder of Ananda Devices. I highly encourage you to participate in her talk. Uh, she will be talking about uh, organs and chiefs and uh, 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 how they are being used to support sustain sustainability in biomedical uh, research. So with that, uh, I also would like to thank everyone for participating uh this uh this uh event today and then wish you all a great day ahead thank you bye thanks for having me